How you guys doing today? It's Anthony Ganji. Welcome to another episode of Tear Talk. I know you guys can't see this now, but Greg is chewing, and I can see him chewing. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm gonna stay focused. Oh, what is that? What is that? Grapes? All right. So sorry, guys. I'll, I'll, I'll stay focused. Guys, we're gonna continue our discussion on PTSD. We've had some very good conversations. First, starting off with William Young, who's the author of When Home Becomes a Housing Unit. Uh, then we move forward and shared the story of Tony Scaglione who basically, guys, if you get a chance, you really got to watch that video. He's going to share a story where he did have to take someone's life, but in the process, his partner was killed. And the story is very moving, but there's a lot to learn because he also showed us how to have the insight in yourself to notice if you have concerns and also resources. And then we continued the dialogue with Cody Cook, who some of you guys may be familiar with her. She's on the LEO Roundtable a uh, very informative guest. Again, we explored her story, which again was just a tremendous story. It, it, it mattered. It's, it's about putting that vulnerability out there on the table, which I thought she did in such a terrific way. Just put a lot of things to light and then also sharing out the resources because she had experience with these concerns. So I think there was a lot that she had to offer. And again, that was the last video that we posted up. Now, today we're going to explore a little bit more. I'm going to uh, have Cody back on. We'll meet her again shortly. I'm also going to have Renice Bain on. She's out from Hawaii. She is a family member of a fallen hero. So she also went through something traumatic. And a lot of people don't really understand what the families go through. So we're going to have her tell her story. And uh, we're going to have me and Greg are going to complement the correction side, also building on the dialogue that we have throughout this table. And Cody's also going to kind of chime in on the police officer side of things. But again, also to try to explore the dialogue. You never know where the dialogue can go on this show. There's really nothing scripted here, but I promise you guys, these dialogues go deep. So uh, I'm going to start first with Cody. Cody, do you mind introducing yourself to our audience? Hi, everybody. I'm Cody Ann Cook. I'm a police, uh, retired police officer from upstate New York. Um, I worked in a variety of agencies and uh, in different positions, whether it be doing federal prisoner transports, in the courthouse, uh, navigational patrol. I did undercover narcotics for 10 years and majority of my career was road patrol. Um, and thank you for having me. Always a pleasure, Cody. It looks like you're gonna be on two panels now, <laughs> the way this is going, one for LEO, one for Tear Talk. But it's always great having you. Your information is phenomenal and very, very deep. Thank uh, you. Oh, one of our regulars, we have Connie, my just my overall expert with not just medical, but just civilian stuff. And she's always happy and she's wearing a green shirt. Connie? <laughs> Hi, my name is Connie Aline and I am the founder and president of the Civilian Corrections Academy. Um, I spent 10 years on Rikers Island as a health services manager, another five years and Connecticut Department of Corrections as a prison health administrator. And I'm excited to talk about today because I never really talk about the fact that I started my career as a New York State EMT. So trauma and PTSD is just part of who I am. I just don't like to talk about it, which is part of PTSD. So I look forward to us moving forward in this conversation. Connie, you know, it's always a pleasure having you. Uh, also, Connie's involved in a Civilians Correction Academy. So if you watch this, you're in corrections. You know, check out the website. Uh, she knew that there was a gap when it came to training for civilians, and she did what she could to provide that training. And it looks like the business is going very well. And I'm um, just looking forward to hearing her give us the ending to the show today. I think that's going to no. be uh, no. great. She, she's always willing, always willing. Uh, and I do appreciate that, Connie. Thank you for stepping up. Uh, Greg Fisher. Uh, I'm sorry, Greg Fisher. Sorry, guys. Greg Piper. I don't know why. I, all of a sudden, Piper became Fisher to me, but. Guys, Greg Piper is just a man of just really great intelligence. His uh, information about corrections comes from the fact that he's been to pretty much every facility almost in the country just training and making sure that, you know, we're doing the best when it comes to safety and security. And he's part of a great company called Guardian RFID. Uh, Guardian RFID, and I, I don't have what I, I'm, I'm sure Greg will have what needs to be said, um, but I just want to talk about the person behind it who's just a very good he, he believes in what we do. He does what, we, what he can to make sure that we get that proper recognition. I'm just proud to have him as part of the Tear Talk family. Uh, hey, Greg, always a pleasure having you on. Thanks, Tony. I'm really happy to be here and being surrounded by this wonderful panel of folks who care enough about corrections and law enforcement and families to spend a little of our own time 
to uh, just meet with you folks and just talk and share our experiences. Uh, Tony's correct. I work for Guardian RFID. Been with Guardian about three and a half years. Uh, been to maybe 220 jails across the country, visiting with corrections professionals, assisting them with their risk needs, helping them, encouraging them, listening to them and sharing with them stories of encouragement uh, while implementing a, a system of software where for inmate tracking, uh, just backing the thin gray line everywhere we go and in everything we do. Uh, that's just been my passion. Uh, prior to my time with Guardian, I spent about 12 years between state and county facilities working corrections. So I've done my fair share of time behind the walls. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Again, big fan of uh, what you do, Greg. Also, there was a great video that came out from Guardian RFID. Check out the YouTube channel. It's about PTSD. Go figure. It got released earlier today. Just a great video. It's about two and a half minutes and um, just a lot of information being provided. So thanks again, Greg, for coming on. Thank you, Guardian, for what you do. Uh, we also have Miss um, Renice Bain, correct? Am I saying your name correct? I want to make sure. Okay, you can unmute yourself. That's fine. Everybody else is muted. So you can unmute yourself if you want. Uh, okay, hold on. This is where I come in, guys. As okay. the hope Oh, she got it. Okay, well. Hey, guys. So real quick, Renice Bain comes out of uh, Hawaii, actually. So she's a six-hour time difference. And she's going to share her story first. Uh, her husband was on the job, died in the line of duty. She'll be more specific with the details, but we're going to travel with her on the journey of what happened after she lost her husband. Basically, just it didn't stop after her husband passed. There were still other concerns that uh, she went through, and I think the key here is that there's a lot for us to learn there, and I wanted to bring her on to share that story, and I know that her story is going to create dialogue amongst the panel because Greg and Connie have not heard her story yet and guys there's some information that you have to pay attention to because if you don't there are some mistakes that were made from this fallen hero that you know we don't want to have to do you know so make sure that we follow uh, her story because her story is meant to teach us so through the sacrifices of others we should learn this way the sacrifice doesn't go in vain now guys if you haven't the show tear talks for you so please subscribe interact engage comment hit that bell that bell's going to notify you every time i post a video connie you should remember that at that point and uh, when I come back from our sponsors, we are going to talk about PTSD. I wanted to attend a university that had an intelligence program. I wanted to look at problems different. I wanted to increase my critical thinking abilities. AMU offered those avenues to expand. Obtaining your degree as an adult, you're actually paying yourself and investing in yourself. You can't put a dollar on it. It's priceless. It's something that can never be taken away from you. American Military University. Learn from the leader. Guys, inmate manipulation is a course that is highly needed. It's the process that's so slow moving and subtle that you don't realize it's happening. When inmates choose to manipulate, they manipulate our need to react. Situational awareness and insight is going to save your career gonna save you from doing foolish things. Listen to your gut. So the more insight we have, the more we can recognize what isn't so overt, and we can correct our behavior before we fall into a trap that we can't get out of. If you allow an inmate to pull you out of your prescribed role, you are opening up a door for a host of problems. Inmate manipulation, the psychology behind inmate manipulation, available now. Link in description. And we are back. So, guys, first off, this is going to be a very deep dialogue. Uh, there's a three shows we did prior, so there could be some continuation of what we had already discussed, but I promise you there's going to be new information here because we have new players. But I would love to start off with Renice's story. So, Renice, uh, if you can just unmute yourself and just, you know, Greg and Connie haven't heard it yet, and neither has my audience, so um, take the mic. Hi, everybody. Aloha from Hawaii. Um, my name is Renice Bain. I am the surviving spouse of Officer Bryant Bain, who was a SWAT team member of the Honolulu Police Department. Um, his end of watch was in uh, on July 
1995. Um, I uh, a little bit about me today. I am currently a full-time student, but I, I started a company called No AL Associates, which was a brainchild from all of the crisis that my children and I had endured during, um, you know, following my husband's death. And basically for 19, now going on 20 years, I've been traveling all over, um, started from my husband's department, um, specifically in the SWAT department, and then they referred me outward to other um, departments, and then it went to local, state, federal, and national, where um, the whole intent of my sharing my story and the urgency of bringing the attention to, you guys got to get your paperwork in order because everybody puts it off. Once they get into, the, they go into the recruits, they fill up a ton of paperwork and then they forget about it because they've been um, pushed out into the field to go do their work, but no one addresses the paperwork that they initially filled out. Um, my children and I became uh, products of that oversight. And um, so going back into 1995, um, Bryant and I had just gotten married and we were talking about trying to save up for a house. We sort of kind of did things backwards. We had a kid and then we got married and then we tried to save for the house. So um, I closed up shop with my apartment and we moved in with his parents or his family. Um, so on July 20th, it was Thursday, I miscarried our baby. Um, <clears throat> and so the following morning, Bryant said, you know, he got called in. He was actually supposed to be called off, but he got called in. He apologized for not being able to go with me to the doctors to go check and see if the baby was still alive or if we needed to remove it and what have you. So he, he left. Um, and then I went to the doctors and then I got a page. This was Friday on the 21st, um, that he, um, the helicopter crashed. And this was just from another police officer, another SWAT mem member's wife. A Honolulu Fire Department rescue chopper crashes and burns in the mountains above Sacred Falls. A pilot and two police officers were on board. Good morning. Thank you for joining us on this Aloha Friday, the 21st of July. It is the worst tragedy in the history of the Honolulu Fire Department's rescue operation. Fire Department helicopter Air One carrying three people the pilot and two Honolulu police officers crashed today into a steep cliff above Sacred Falls State Park. A fiery crash on the fifth day of a search for a missing hiker has left the pilot confirmed dead. His body was located at the crash site. Now a massive search and rescue operation is underway for two missing police officers. The crash site is about a half mile above Sacred Falls. So back then we were only working off of pagers we didn't have cell phones and immediate com communication. So um, a wife contacted me, said the helicopter crashed. They had Bryant and his, his partner Tate on it. Um, and so they were, people were looking all over the place for me and for Val, who's Tate's wife. Um, and so we, we made our way. We were driving all over the place. Nobody knew what to do with us. We called the department. We tried to figure out where the command post was, and we were basically on the freeway going everywhere except nowhere. Um, and then finally, I called the, the, the SWAT department, which is located at the basement, and, and one of the guys called, um, picked up the phone, and he said, why don't you just come in, and we'll figure out you know, how to help you. Um, I could tell from his voice that it wasn't, it, that everybody was scared. And so I went and picked up Val. We went over to the department and it, we ended up being held in the witness protection site in the department um, because the press started to pick up some momentum and wanting questions and what have you. Um, we never really got any answers at that time. We were watching it unfold on the news. Family members started to show up slowly. Um, and then uh, the chief came in and he said, you know, everybody was out in the bushes and basically what had happened was there was a search and rescue for two college students who had gone hiking gone off the trails and got lost and so they had launched this search and rescue earlier in the week the weather wasn't really good the um they were trying to go in by air in a helicopter um and the cloud cover kept coming in 
when Bryant came home on Wednesday, I could tell he was shaken and that something was kind of awry. And so we sat and we talked about some of the details that, you know, had happened and why he was a little bit, you know, a little bit off that day. Um, and then that was it about our conversation. So I was sort of surprised that, you know, why are you guys having this search? Because it was supposed to be, and, you know, it was over 72 hours of that search and it should have ended, but pulling strings and what have you, they ended up having to get called out and go do that final search on that Friday. The weather was just as bad as it was when they called off the search. Um, they flew into cloud cover, um, and then there's all kinds of just big boo-boos made on that part as far as removing the, the spotter from the, the helicopter. So they had no eyes and they relied on the pilot. Um, and end result is the pilot flew into the mountain. And my husband and Tate were hanging outside of the basket. They were being ferried in on a supply basket that the fire department usually hauls supplies in. They were going to be flown in on the basket, lowered down into clear a landing zone so that they could ferry the dogs, the, the, search, um, the search and rescue dogs up. But that didn't happen because they ended up crashing. Um, and then so Val and I sat at the, at the department for quite a while until they said, okay, they're going to call off the search. And I, and I was really upset because I thought my, if my husband's injured, he's going to be spending the night out in the mountains and God knows what's going to happen. So the, they took us home. Um, and told us that someone was going to come pick us up early in the morning to take us out to the command post. So this was located at the north side of the island. So it was quite a drive to get out there. Um, they cordoned off a, an elementary school and, and staged their command post there. And uh, basically, we, the families were placed on the second floor level of a classroom building. And um, up to this point, no one told me that this was going to end bad. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure they all wanted it to not end bad, but I wasn't prepared. I'm from a different island. I live on an island where my family is not. And so no one thought forward to say, hey, you need, we need to get you some support system. And maybe do you have any family members that can come sit with you? So I was basically sitting there by myself with my sister-in-law who eventually came and joined me, but that was it. And then on the other end of the classroom building, Val and her entire family was all down there. So there was like 20 plus people on that end. And we were basically waiting all day because you could hear the helicopters hovering over and going you know, into the mountains. And they, they um, enlisted the Coast Guard. I mean, they pulled out all stops to look for these guys to find them. They found the pilot in the fuselage Friday um, because the fuselage was was um, crashed and, and stuck to the side of the mountain with him. But my husband and Tate were lost somewhere in this thing because they were outside in the basket. And so they, they had to figure out where these guys got slung around from the helicopter and where they landed. They found Tate first, from my understanding of the recount of all of the, the investigations that they, that they did. And then they found Bryant. Um, so the way I got my death notification was alone was without any um, family support. Well, my immediate family support. I mean, I, I can't say my sister-in-law wasn't my support, but she was there. Um, and um, my husband's friend approached me and I could tell he was, he had bad news because when he approached me, he was crying already. And I just heard these loud screams at the other end of the school and, you know, looking back now, that was when Val and her family had received the news that they had found the guys and they had perished in the crash. Um, and then I couldn't even hear myself because I think I was screaming, but I'm not sure. Um, I just know I was backing away from my from his friend. And I was thinking, if he doesn't come to me and tell me what's going on, uh, I, I won't have to hear it. Um, so they ended up bringing us downstairs and we were taken over to the ambulance where the, the, the guy's bodies were in the body bags and we each had our own ambulance. And so they wanted us, you know, we wanted to, to hold our husbands, but they said, don't touch the bags, you know, and you could see blood splatters on it and stuff. But we sat there and everything just kind of felt really numb and surreal. And just, it was everything, it wasn't real, you know, it just, it just wasn't a real situation. And so, we sat there for a while, I don't know how long, and then they moved me to a classroom and I was there for however long, but still now, mind you, there's no f support system that's coming my way. I'm still not getting that. I'm not thinking that I need it because I'm still trying to process what did they just tell me. 
Um, and then they put me in a car um, and ferried me home. And I remember my sister-in-law was sitting next to me and they put my husband's work bag, his duffel bag in my lap. And I, I was sort of kind of numb, but I knew well enough to dig into the side pocket to fish out his wedding ring because he takes it off when he does all this repelling and SWAT stuff. So I just kind of hung on to that wedding ring and went home and then I made my way into my room. Now this is my in-laws house. And I sat there and I thought, okay, I, I have, I don't know what to do. No one's talking to me. I, I, I'm not getting any instructions. Not that I thought that somebody was supposed to give that to me, but it would have been nice now that I looking, looking back. Um, and then I had people come into the house and tell me, you know, I hope you're thinking of things to give your stepdaughter. And, and I was like, wait, what, what are you guys talking about? I, I didn't even tell my kids that their dad died. So it was just all of this, like everybody's, to me, is like everybody's agendas started to show. And people were working off of their agenda. And you can't ding anybody for having their own agenda. But in the middle of this whole crisis, there was no guidance or, or dialogue as far as what's going to happen. It was just drop you off and we leave and then, you know, good luck. Um, so my in-laws house filled up pretty quickly with all kinds of people. We attempted to have a conversation about what to do. And this was with me and my in-laws, um, which they didn't like any of the ideas that I had. And, and then there was tension and all this junk stuff started to happen, um, which rolled into just worse things with the, the years coming. Um, so anyway, um, I was taken to the funeral home to sign off on paperwork. My husband, because I was his legal wife at the time, um, I, that was the only um, key that I had in order to make decisions. Otherwise, it was pretty much everybody else was saying, no, they'll make the decisions. I was just a young, stupid wife. I was 28 years old. And I was probably young and stupid, but um, I, you know, I just, I felt discounted in the, in the conversation. And when they were saying, you know, we need you to just sign off on the paperwork so we can cremate your husband. And I was just like, but I want to see him. I, I, you guys can't just take him away from me. Um, and they, you know, we got, I literally got into a huge fight with the police officers that was his friends that was in that room trying to force me to make these decisions. And finally, the funeral director guy said, okay, stop, everybody, time out. We're going to, what we'll do is we'll attempt to clean him up. We'll have him draped, but you, we'll let you, we'll allow you to see your husband. Because I said, I want to touch him. I want to touch, like, I know every inch of that man's body from the top of his head to the bottom of his toes. If you just give me a quarter-sized piece of his skin, I'll know it's him. Just let me touch him before you guys, you know, cremate him. And so the funeral director heard me. Everybody else was like, you're ridiculous. That's, that's impossible. Don't do that. Um, and I realized they were trying to protect me from not seeing the state of Bryant's body. I, I, I understood that. But what they, did, what they didn't understand was that there are ways to preserve this, to allow the families to have this, that closure. And we all hate the word closure, but that's the only way we can describe it, is to have this, this meaningful end rather than it being told to us. Um, so the next day they brought me to the, back to the funeral home and I was able to, you know, the guy was really cool. He was able to salvage my husband's whole right arm, you know, and I could see the break in, in his arm, but they had him cleaned up. I was able to hold his hands. I was able to talk to him. Um, it felt a little bit awkward and a little bit intruded on because there was all these gin ginormous police officers that were behind me getting ready to pounce on me if I was uh, if I attempted to move the drape so I kind of felt like my time with him was a little invaded on um, but I understood why they did that but I wish they didn't you know now looking back and so that's some some of those things that I promote towards the other officers when they're trying to make plans for other um, line of duty deaths that came up so um, we ended up placing my husband in a niche at this memorial um, place that uh, we, I did not have a, a funeral plan. I did not have a burial plan. So we sort of made shift with whatever we had. They placed my husband's ashes in a temporary niche. And then three months later, we moved them to what was a permanent niche. And then 15 years later, I had to 
put him, take him out and put him back in because his um, urn had rotted down and the ashes were all over the place and people didn't realize that that had happened. So just poor planning all the way across. Um, about a month later, my children and I ended up homeless. We were told that we were holding back the family that from moving on and that we needed to leave. And so my one-year-old and my five-year-old at the time and I were kind of living like gypsies in our box in a car and we were living from house to house until a family took us in. And one of the family members had asked their landlord, can you please like give an empty unit to this family until we find her a permanent place to stay? So that's sort of kind of how I ended up in this makeshift townhome. Um, and it was because it was approaching Christmas and we had really nowhere to go. Um, and then... Um, when the benefits started coming in, I ended up getting served a notice for to go to court because I was being sued for my husband's um, benefits um, because the the plaintiff was um, claiming that they had first rights to my husband's um, benefits and and then we were supposed to just take whatever was left of it. Uh, so then we ended up in and out of court for that. Um, there was a wrongful, law, uh, wrongful death lawsuit that was filed against the city and the county. Um, and it was because we weren't getting any answers. So a lot of people just kept saying, well, you know, you're just greedy widows. You guys just want money. And it had nothing to do with that. It had to do with everybody um, keeping information to themselves. And the information that was actually coming out was your husband's head was chopped off from the helicopter blade. So I had PTSD for up to seven years thinking every time I closed my eyes, my headless husband would be coming toward me. And I ended up going to Washington DC to meet this, this psychiatrist who um, did this de uh, rapid eye desensitization, desensitization tr treatment or technique thing on me to move this image in the back because it started to take a toll on me. Um, there was all kinds of physical, mental impacts that had occurred with me, as well as still trying to manage and function daily to tend to my one-year-old, my five-year-old. Um, at the time, I had an eight-year-old stepdaughter and I lost my relationship with her. So that's another thing that I, I always emphasize to these families is like, when there is a death of the officer, that's not the only thing we lose. We lose relationships on both sides. We lose, we lose what's supposed to be normally, uh, what's our normal life, and everything has to start from ground zero, and we have to build on that. Um, so that was pretty. This is pretty much just the nutshell. There's so much more detail, and um, without getting too much into the who said and what said. Um, the basic gist of it was when we, when I filed my life insurance forms, there was multiple life insurances. There was some that was entitled to me because I was the wife. Thank God that was the only thing that I had in my back pocket was my marriage certificate. Anything else, if there was someone else's name. So there was a, a life insurance that I was paying for while I was with my husband. And it actually went to a past relationship of his. So that person ended up getting the life insurance. Um, and then the, the rest was what I was being sued for because I had a stepdaughter and everybody thought I wasn't going to share the money with her, which was kind of ridiculous. But um, yeah, so we were going in and out of court for that. Um, <clears throat> there was other people when I went into the departments to file my claims, the claims were already filed on my behalf by someone else. So that had to get corrected. Um, prior to all of this, I was... Like I said, I was 28. I didn't really quite have a well-rounded idea of life and the process and the system and what was going on. I was just kind of too young and green behind the ears to to know better. But in this process, I ended up getting mad. I ended up finding my voice. My voice ended up becoming obnoxious. <laughs> I ended up, I mean, I had to force myself to stand up and and speak out and say no because at, up until that time I was being taken advantage of I was being told what I was doing wrong you're talking you're talking to too many people you're crying too much you're crying too little you're crying in the wrong place you need to go cry back on this side and I mean just the ridiculous instructions that everybody thought they were all professionals in how you're supposed to grieve and the only time that I actually caught wind of good 
good information was, was when these two widows from California flew to Hawaii because I guess they knew what I was going to walk into. And by this time, I was starting to shut down and talking to people because everybody's unsolicited ex- advice was really upsetting. Um, and then these two women came up to me and they said, well, our husbands were killed in the line of duty and we know what you're going through. And it was like the skies parted because I felt like finally these people who are, who are strangers to me, they really do know what I'm going through because their husbands were killed in the line of duty. So that's when I made that peer connection and connected with the Concerns of Police Officers. Um, it's a national organization. Um, and then I ended up just, you know, years rolling forward. It was figure my way out, fight it out, um, go to court. I've been in and out of court. I can't tell you how many times to defend myself or fight for benefits that was supposed to be ours. Um, you know, and it, it was way more ugly than it should have been. And when I go, now that I, I travel nationally and, and do speaking engagements and stuff, and to be honest with you, when I'm sharing this story, I keep thinking I spent more time doing the shitty things and, and fighting and not remembering my husband because I have to defend myself constantly with all of these other people. Um, I don't think I was, I actually had a really good grieving cry for seven years until like I, I actually, when things started to finally settle down with all of these lawsuits and stuff. And um, I just had this reality check, like, geez, I, I haven't even had a chance to grieve yet. Um, it was a long time. Um, there's still some residuals from that that occurs today. My children are grown now. My one and my five-year-old are married with children. Um, There's still hurtful things that are happening where they're not even considered the children of Bryant Bain. You know, they don't exist and it's hurtful. So we've kind of put our place, put ourselves in a place where we know who we are. We don't have to go kick down doors to go demand everybody know that we are his family. We're just pretty much in a place where we're sick and tired of having to explain ourselves. And whoever wants to put themselves out there to bring the attention to themselves that they're more in Bryant's life than ours, we've just conceded and just said, knock yourself out. We're okay with us. And we've had to um, kind of build our our support system as a close-knit group and and start to cut people off because it was getting so toxic and ugly and, and just crappy. Yes, Cody. Can you again, repeat what the name is of the program that you started in case somebody wants you to come and speak about your experience, please? Oh, so there's several, there are several different titles. It depends on what they want. So I do talk about proper death notification Um, The one that I keep being invited to go talk on is uh, I buried my husband three times and the premise is about just poor planning and what happens. (laughs) Um, I also talk, uh, I talk about um, agency abandonment. My agency really tried hard to help, but they were so ill-equipped. They're, they're on it now. We had a really great chief that came on board after our, the chief that was serving when I was, Uh, when Bryant was on, um, had passed away. So we had another chief come on and that chief was phenomenal and a huge supporter of wanting to make sure that the other families on his watch were not going to go through the same thing that we had gone through. Um, And then that's when they had enlisted me to go into the the um, annual recall training for the department. So it was, I think it was at the time it was like 50 something classes throughout the year that everybody had to go back to for the recertifications. And my class was stuck in the process of that. So it was every week I'd go back and talk to every single um, officer, the recruits, the retired officers, the uh, reserve officers, anybody that I could get my hands on to say, look at your paperwork and pay attention, pay closer attention to, to your stuff. Um, I'm, I'm emailing um, Anthony the, the names of, of the resources that I got. So basically, my first support came from Concerns of Police Survivors. Every state has a local chapter. So that's the place that we would send the, the survivors to go to. And those, eight, those chapters are made up of, of fellow survivors. They have siblings, parents, 
um, spouses, children, adult children, the young children, and co-workers, um, support systems for, for all of those categories. So I would definitely recommend them to go there. Um, I, would also, I also encourage these officers to um, look for local attorneys who are, who are contributing their um, community service time pro bono. There's certain programs with the states that um, these guys go and they sign up to do free services because it's a community service thing that they, that they contribute. Um, so I would look for the attorneys, start with your state, um, see if any of you, if you guys have like a business action center that has these attorneys come in and check in and they write their names down on the list and you just go talk to them. But you know, it depends on what you want to talk about. So you, you definitely want an estate attorney to help you. Um, and then there's a lot of um, families when the officers are killed uh, or, or die, there's a lot of children who are in flux. They don't belong with the parents. There's no child custody papers clarified. The divorce was not clear. The divorce was clear. You know, there's all these different lines, um, gray areas where the children fall into the gap. So you definitely want to try to enlist the attorney that's respective to the issue that you need to make sure you address instead of putting it off. Um, a lot of our officers always say, yeah, I, I needed to take care of it, but I can't afford an attorney, which is why I go back to, you have to look at your state department to see if there's a program where there's um, attorneys. And, and, and if it's not from the state department, look at your bar association. Somewhere in, in the state, somebody knows that there's a list of attorneys who want to contribute pro bono time to help. Um, if you do that, you have to go in with your questions already preset, with your issues already preset. If you have children, make sure you have their social security number, their names, things like that. Go in with the details so you don't waste that. Pro the pro bono time is a limited time. So you want to make sure you come in with all of your arsenal so that you can get down to the, the, to the nuts and bolts of what you really need help with rather than hemming and hawing over all the, the information you're going to waste time over. Um, I'm also sending... Um, uh, Anthony, my crisis booklet that I put together that I take with me, and it's a PDF. Um, it's been compiled over the years. It's evolved, um, and and I pass it out like hotcakes because it's basically just kind of helping you, helping these officers to organize their their thoughts or raise questions as to you know maybe something that they didn't think of. Um, there are all kinds of different types of um, resources and supplies out there that will help you organize your financial household, your relationship, um, you know, paperwork and what have you. But this is just a, a starter. Yes, yes, Cody. Um, would you happen to have an email that you feel comfortable giving out that the public can reach you, uh, a department or an individual if they wanted to, or even a, a spouse who's enduring some of what you have? Do you have a, a public means for people to contact you? I do. Um, it's a little bit of a complicated um, email because it's in Hawaiian, <laughs> but I'll do it really slowly. It's November Oscar Echo alpha uniform alpha sierra sierra oscar charlie at gmail.com so it's no al associates um and i'm also sending that on to um to anthony so that he can um, i don't know how you can put it out there anthony but you're more than welcome to send it out there my phone number will also be listed um okay great yeah um, I just want to add one thing to what you're talking about with death notifications and the process to help people that there's actually a death notification class for first responders that's through the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation. That class is presented and invented actually by George Everly, who's a PhD, and Jeffrey Mitchell, who are the founders of the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation. Uh, they have lots of books and classes that they offer on a variety, variety of trauma and crisis situations. Um, and also the Canadian, uh, um, inter Canadian response and crisis teams offer classes on death notifications. And I've been in law enforcement for a long time and I've done many death notifications in my career. I ended up taking the class uh, as a prerequisite for something I was doing and was really 
astounded at some of the things that they brought up and, and, and attention to details they brought up about death notifications and stuff I had never thought of. Um, I thought it was an interesting class. It was well done. It was well presented. And I think it's a great opportunity for anybody, whether they're in corrections, law enforcement, a firefighter, an EMT, it's just, you know, there's really good information for people to collaborate with others and do what needs to be done to support people exactly like you who have endured what you, you have where notifications and support systems were missing. So I, uh, and I also want to commend you on bringing up the idea of closure. There's a lot of people that lose a loved one and, and people don't give them, whether it's funeral home directors or law enforcement professionals or, you know, first responders don't give that individual enough credit to think that they can tolerate seeing their loved one deceased. And I, and people do need closure. So I commend you on bringing that up. And I think, you know, if you could elaborate a little bit on seeing your husband deceased versus being told about your husband being deceased, I think that's an important thing for those of us in law enforcement and corrections and firefighting and EMS to think about. Um, and maybe you could just elaborate on why you felt that was important and val and if, you know, basically led to you having a disgruntled uh, argument about it with other people where you were trying to make your point. If you could just tell us a little bit about that, please. Sure. So a little, going back a little bit, um, I, I am SISM certified. So I did get my, my, some training from there, but um, the FBI also um, for law enforcement agencies, the FBI also does a training on, on death notification and then concerns of police survivors. They also do, um, several different classes for um, mm -hmm. for the law enforcement um, or anybody of of um, public service um, public officers public what am I talking about public safety officers there we go um, so the so being told versus being um, allowing us to see our loved one um, one of my really good friends so I ended up becoming a for seven years, I worked at a funeral home um, because I kept going back to the funeral home to help the families who lost their officers. And I kept spending more time there. And they were like, you know, if you're just going to keep coming here, we may as well pay you. And I was like, you're right. You should start paying me because I'm helping with, you with the families. Um, so I ended up becoming employed. And, uh, um, and I met the people who are actually in the back room who prepare the bodies for the funeral. And I met this lovely lady who, um, when we got to talking, I shared my story. And um, this was way back in like early 2000s. So she had just contacted me last year and she said that she's now the head person at this funeral home. Um, and she was invited as a speaker to, um, I, I think it was like a national me medical examiners conference where everybody, all of those special people who take, who does that type of job had come together and they had asked her to be a speaker. Um, and she said that she had to reach out to me to ask permission to share my story because she said it was super significant as far as the story that I shared because I said all, up until the law, up until the lawsuit and the, the court case, I was led to believe that my husband's head was missing because he got wound up in the propeller, he got chopped by the propeller, and then he got flown into a deep ravine where they found his body. Um, and so what the psychiatrist who was working with me had said, if we're, it's like um, uh, Vanna White, what is that, that show called? The one with the letters. The Wheel, Wheel of Fortune. Fortune. Yep. <laughs> I saw everybody's mouth like, wheel of fortune. So he said, our brains work in that same way. It's, it's like, even if the letters are not turned, our brains with our education, our culture, our knowledge, our information, what have you, will fill in those blanks for us, even if we don't see the letters revealed. And he said, it's the same concept with information that we take in. And whatever is missing, our brain of what we understand is going to make up the rest of it. And so where my brain took me was in the most traumatic place of what I understood from the, the, the hodgepodge information that was given to me. Um, at the law, at the, um, during the case or during the, the court case, the medical examiner came up and he had the silhouette of the body where he had to indicate where the injuries were. 
And that's when I, I learned my husband's head wasn't cut off. He had injuries to his head, but it wasn't like he was headless. And when I shared that information with this gal from the, the funeral home, she said, that's terrible. That's awful that you had to walk around with that. And, and no one had thought to provide proper information. And so what, pe what these officers see, I, I get it. I understand. I've never seen it, but I, I understand that you folks are subjected to some horrific, horrific, um, you know, views of people's bodies that are not supposed to be in the shape that they are when you find them or when you see them die in front of you. I, I understand that. And I understand that they were trying to protect me from seeing what the state of Bryant's body was. Um, but at the same time, um, and even the chiefs from the different departments had finally learned and understood because they, they were, the widows were pretty upset thinking, you mean I could have viewed my husband after talking to Rennie's, you know? So they're like, okay, we got to do better at maybe having a better conversation and narrative about what can we do? Is this a salvageable situation where the, you know, if the spouse is, uh, wants to, um, view the bodies and and even at the in the funeral home that was the same thing this gal was saying she said you know we don't give families proper credit of being able to you know process and we're, we're taking away their their opportunity to process so um when we say we want to view our husbands we don't i don't want to view him where all of his injuries are i want to view him where there, the injuries are not where it's safe to be able to touch a portion of him, a piece of him, you know? Um, and everybody else was even surprised, was, were just as surprised that um, I was only asking for a quarter size, but the funeral home was able to give me his entire right arm to hold and hug. And that was way more than I had expected. And I'm glad I fought for that because I would have missed the opportunity to hold him and, and say my goodbyes. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that, does that answer your question, Cody? Absolutely. And I'm, I'm sorry for your loss. And I commend you on how you've handled all the obstacles you've had to overcome. I think it's, you know, it's a testimony to your spirit and, you know, survival that you've taught your children and that other, you know, loved ones who lose somebody in the line of duty, um, whether it be law enforcement, corrections, firefighter, EMS, uh, it, you know, it gives them some insight on what you've endured and why things have to change. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, the, yeah. you know, I'm going to the point of the talking about death notification. Um, it's, it's, it's both sides responsibilities. It's the responsibility of the agency to have this conversation and have a specific protocol set in place of how is this going to happen and who's going to do it. I mean, uh, Obviously, it's not going to be a specific name, but there's got to be some type of frame structured around how it's going to happen and should happen and have that flexibility of adjusting depending on the circumstance. But on the other side of the token, these officers have to have that conversation with their spouses because a lot of the times it's like, you know, they're assuming, well, if something happens to me, I'll let my best friend take care of it for me. But what if your spouse doesn't like your best friend? What if your best friend is a sleaze bag? you know, and that's who you're leaving to tend to your business. That's not something that, you know, that's a conversation that has to happen on the family side as well. It sounds like this is really something that needs to be addressed from the get-go in the academy so that when people come out and they're done with their, their internships and, the, and their ride-alongs and their probations and all the things they have to do, becoming new in the field, you know, in the corrections facility or in, in the law enforcement field, that they are already prepared to start thinking about these things. You know, it's kind of like evolving and maturing in your relationships. You start to realize what you need to talk about and what's important. So it seems like this needs to be part of the academy um, to make sure it's in the forefront of people's minds, what their responsibility is. Um, and I believe Anthony uh, Ganji had a, had a question. Yeah, I want to actually add on to something. I think Greg is going to want to add on to so that I want to make sure we don't overlook the importance of getting that paperwork done. So I know Greg wants to touch on that a little bit, but also uh, it may be harder for bigger departments, but definitely for those smaller departments, you have a close knit community. So maybe when a tragedy happens, there's someone that the family knows there that they're able to 
communicate with, kind of like as a liaison, which would be different for each family. But as you get to the bigger departments, it, it becomes more, it's sad to say, it may become more of just a formality. You know, it may just become like, well, this is the person that usually handles that news. Yeah, but, you know, there should be a finesse. And that finesse comes with knowing that family. And it's a shame that for those bigger agencies, they don't do more events that can encourage that interaction. Like, I would love to go to family events at my job. You know, I have over 800 something employees, you know, so I would love to be able to interact and know their families. Or, or the more important thing is to really get them to know me. Like, I may not be able to remember all their families, but they should be able to kind of know who I am only because of my, my position. You know, therefore, they get a sense of who you are. And then when something happens, there's a connect automatically that they know they can go to you. But the key here is that through you, they begin to have a trust for the um, agency. Um, right. So, oh, go ahead. Yeah. So um, for the smaller ones, it's usually, I, I usually find out it's the chief that's usually part of the, the team because they're that small. Um, with the larger agencies, I get it. It's huge. And, and ours home here is huge. It's like 2000. So um, we can get lost in the numbers. Sorry. I think that's where chaplains sometimes can be of help. You know, some departments have a, a crisis team that includes a chaplain. Yeah. Yeah. And then also, but then, so then that, again, that goes back to the conversation with the families. If the officer has had the conversation with his spouse about how he wants this, his death to be managed, his spouse would be given a voice. If there's people approaching her, she'll have that document in hand and she can say, stop, let's, this is how I prefer this to unfold. You know, we've, we've got to be able to give these, these, these family members a little bit more material and a lot more empowerment to be able to say how they want these, these things to unfold. Um, it, it, I understand it gets difficult and there's some gray areas when it's like a, a criminal type of situation, um, you know, but there's, there's some standards that we can follow. It, it is possible to follow and it is possible for the spouse to say, you know, I mean, because departments will make assumptions to send the send the chaplain, but it might not be the religion that that family member is. You know, the the guy is not is a Christian, but the wife is a Buddhist. You know, so we can't make those assumptions. We've got to be a little bit clearer about how does how do we move forward on that. So the, um, I totally agree with you, um, Cody. It has to start at the departments, um, at the training. It has to start at the um, definitely at the recruits level to make sure that that seed is planted in them, but it, it cannot stop there. It has to be an annual thing. Everybody, every department has to go through an annual recertification. Somewhere in that process, it, there has to be a checkpoint of saying, hey, you know, get human resources involved on this whole certification process, pull the files out, because that's the biggest thing that I keep hearing from human resources is like, well, you know, we send the, the, we send the, the officers the information to update and we don't hear anything. Only until they take your class, we hear it. But it's like, there's got to be a little bit more proactive work here on the department side to say, part of your training is your blood plasma pathogen tests or whatever, your gun shooting certification, and you're going to sit in this class for administration stuff to update your paperwork. Somebody has to do that. Um, there is a lot of bulking about money and expenses of how is, how, you know, who's going to handle this. And they don't have a specific person in the human resources department to manage all of this. But if it's in the, in the training, it can be written into the training budget um, to have this conversation. A lot of these guys financially, they, they, it's either new money to them or it's not enough money and they have a lot of debt. And all of that stuff becomes an issue to the family because the family member is the one that's got to manage all of this stuff. No one's had that conversation with the officers. So it does have to occur at the training. Okay. I think hey, Greg. Oh, sorry. Uh, hey, Greg, I know that you, we wanted to touch on the paperwork. I just want to make sure we don't overlook that. And I know that me and Greg, we actually discussed this before you had come on because I remember we discussed this prior when we had a meet that wasn't, uh, it wasn't a show. It was just an interview to figure out who we are. But I also want to thank Greg. A part of that initiative, would you also believe, is also on the employee? Yeah. And one of my roles when I was with the Department of Corrections, I was the staff development coordinator. So it was my job to ensure that all 250 staff members at the facility 
uh, were in, completed their annual training. And it was part of our training to ensure that paperwork was uh, kept up. But it is absolutely, I would say probably 80% more uh, falls on the employee and 20% on the, uh, the, the, the facility to ensure that that paperwork is complete. One of the pieces that we put into place was we actually uh, requested that all staff, we had a piece of paper that said in the event of any uh, VI, uh, you know, violent or death or anything, which staff member do you want contacting your immediate family? So it wasn't just some representative. We asked the employee, who do you want? Because we wanted to ensure. Now, <laughs> oddly enough, uh, when I first went to the department, I chose my training captain. And then three years later, he died of cancer. So I chose another person who was another mentor of mine. And unfortunately, he also passed away uh, before I left the department. So it, it, it's one of those things you pick people that you want to ment that, that you're mentor of, but that you can, you know, that is the person that's going to go to your family and be able to relate to them. It's not just some person that they choose. Like, like you said so eloquently, it's not just the chaplain who may come and say, hey, well, we're going to look into the Bible, but if they are Buddhist or Muslim or, or, or whatever the religion is, we don't want to offend them. But this de reaches deeper. We've mentioned firefighters, EMT, corrections and law enforcement. But Connie, this also really affects every civilian that walks in those walls because these folks are often overlooked because civilians face the same challenges inside our facilities and working with the police departments and fire departments as the uh, uniformed officers. And they too have to uh, need, need to be included in making sure their families are aware of the dangers and what we preparing them and their paperwork for uh, some inevitable tragedy. Yes. Yeah, I think that um, before we go to Connie, again, just to reiterate, there is a level for management that really needs to probably ha have something out every year to, for updated information or every two years, something that comes out from HR or something. But with that said, if there's an immediate change that can't wait, the onus is going to go on the employee now to say, hey, I have to get this done because the last thing you want, especially when it comes to even medical you know, you, you have another child into this world and you say, oh, I'll just wait for the next open period to put it in now. And then something happens with that child, you're not going to get covered. HR is going to scramble, but there's very little that they can do for you because, again, you had the option to do it and you chose not to. So, you know, it, it kind of battles both ways. And I hate when there's an emergency that happens and then as management, you're chasing to find out where this employee is, phone number, addresses, and it hasn't been updated. And you find out that the employee's been at this other address for five or six years now. So, you know, again, very needed dialogue, just something we had to add as a side note, that paperwork, don't wait, man. Get it done the moment it happens. Get it done the moment it happens. Now, um, okay, yes. I think to add to that, um, so with the employee, especially with our newer recruits or the newer employees, I think the, um, the concern of their paperwork starts to take the back end of the table because of the pressures of having to do the job and having to answer to their up, you know, their, their authorities and, and what have you. So um, as a safety net, I would not only put the onus on entirely on the, on the employee, but on the employees um, uh, next line link up. I don't know who you guys would call that, like the sergeant or the Lieutenant or whoever's in charge of that specific department you know, because like you were saying, it's a large department, but if you can kind of consolidate it down into a manageable size, kind of like, like an ICS pro, um, system, right? You're managing a smaller group of people. That guy on the top, that supervisor on the top, that can be part of his checklist to see the difference, you know, to, to address the change, to address the death, address the remarriage. There's turnovers in, in the public safety officer's world as far as relationships are concerned. Um, you know, there's guys that are marriage number seven, you know, no judgment, but your paperwork got to change when you do that, you know. <laughs> um, so it's the, the supervisors that are in charge of that group that should also try to be held to a level of responsibility to make sure, cause he's there to look out for his group, you know? So, um, and it's, and it's more, not just as an, an added task. It's just because you want to take care of the guys that, you know, you're being put in charge of. I mean, God forbid 
you have an emergency where there's a no call, no show, and you as the agency is trying to figure out where this person is, and you can't, and you exhaust all avenues, only to find out that the person never updated anything. And, you know, and, and, and the agency, if there's a no call, no show, after a certain amount of hours after trying, they're going to call municipalities, they're going to call whatever they can to check on the home. And if the home is not the right address, you got a problem. That's going to be hell for, in our case here, would be a shift commander or the administration, because we got to answer to that. Like, what do you mean your stuff's not up to date? And now we're getting hammed. And I'll guarantee you when that employee comes back to work, that employee's getting written up. Because trust and believe, we're not going to take the fall for that. You know, we're going to put it on you now. Um, um, did you have a closing thought on, on, on that, Cody? Because I saw you open the mic. Yeah, I was going to say that it would be nice if uh, the SOPs would make that, you know, every, every division of, of first responders has something that's a semi-annual or an annual training that's required. So, like for us, we did semi-annual qualifications. That's a great time to sit down. You always have classroom time to go over Article 35, Use of Force. It's a great time to sit down and say, hey, everybody update your emergency contact forms. You know, and there's a variety of questions and, and laborious law stuff that you have to fill out. Do it when you do your annual fire, semi-annual firearms qualifications or some people at CPR, or whatever it is that each department has that's a requirement would be the perfect time to slip that paperwork in with what, whatever else is going on. So it's not an extra expense. It's not time consuming for HR, but it makes sure that it gets done. Yeah. So what I, what I normally do um, is when I go to the agencies, I do like an assessment with the agencies and it's basically just asking them for the application packet that they're going to give to the employee that, that, that wants to come on board. Um, and then I go through that packet and in that packet, there's insurance forms, there's deferred comp, there's workers comp, there's this, you know, your city and county forms, there's your state forms, there's retirement forms, all of those forms are in that packet. And if somebody can go in there, like prior, you know, if you're going to set it up as your SOP, if somebody can go to HR and say, all these packets where they're leaving something to a beneficiary or they have to assign something to an account, pull those forms out and bring that as part of the class. Because, you know, you're telling these guys, you got to update your paperwork, but to them, like, they don't know what that means. Is that a card where I just check a box and send it in and it's a little index card? And it's not. It's like seven different pieces of paperwork that they had, they had initiated um, to process benefits. And they, they don't know. They won't know unless they're looking at their paycheck and they see it as a deduction coming off of their paycheck. That's how they know, like, oh, I think I have life insurance. There was a guy who didn't even know how much life insurance he did. And when we did a grid, an assessment on him, he had a lot of life insurances, but he had duplicate life insurances um, where he didn't need to be paying that much. And then he thought, I'm paying out my butt for these, all these insurances. But in actuality, he was only paying a total of $165 a month for all of these life insurances. You know, so these guys really don't know what they signed up for. They don't understand it. They'll nod their head, especially in recruit class, they'll nod their head a lot. But then you ask them two, two years later, do you remember having this conversation about that specific form you signed? And they're like, no, I, I kind of don't know. So in this annual recall or annual check, um, it's not only good to tell them, update your paperwork. It's showing them what paperwork you're talking about. And it's re-explaining to them what this paperwork is. There's the dummies. It can be dummied down to you know, just use simple language, cut out all the insurance jargon and just say, this is the paperwork that will, that will cover you and your family for this amount of money, for this amount of, you know, to whom and whatever. Um, each, each form comes with a detailed, uh, with detailed information, but it can be simplified, but it needs to be pulled out and it needs to be um, detailed to the, to the guys instead of just being thrown as a general term, update your stuff. Yeah, you know, I'm glad that we were able to go through it, even though um, it was a bulk of our dialogue today. It's very important that we get this out because I have a feeling that, it, like you said, it's not being updated. So it's good that we got a chance to explore this. Uh, and I know Greg, I don't think, and, and Connie will tell you, I don't think we've ever thought about this before. So it's great for you to come on the show and just kind of put that reminder there. And for people who, you know, haven't done it, you know, go and get it done because look at the end result. It's it just showing no respect to your family. Uh, in the long run, who's going to have to do the battle. Now, in today's times right now, we're dealing with the COVID, obviously. And I wanted to kind of get Connie's perspective on the 
medical side of things because I know that situations are very scary for them. And I remember getting a phone call where I had an employee that was very scared to come to work. And there was part of me as management that wanted to say, don't worry, it's going to be okay. But I also didn't want to lie. So what I told the person was, is I know you can do this, but it's a matter of finding the courage with inside you and motivate yourself to come to work and do this. Cause it is scary times for people, especially working in prisons, but definitely just in the medical system, just as first responders. But I can only talk from the prison experience. Our numbers are just, you know, in the, in the prison, our numbers are high. They're great because it's confined and you have to now motivate people to come to work, knowing that you can't make a promise that you can protect them. And I think for managers like Connie, that's frustrating knowing that you can't do what needs to be done to protect those employees. So my, my question to Connie is, is how do you motivate somebody through this trauma that they're facing right now? And how do you get them to find the courage when they're afraid to come to work? So, I mean, as we know, it's very difficult, you know, for many first responders, many medical folks, you know, the vicarious trauma they experience day to day without necessarily even dealing with COVID is already significant. Um, many of them are feeling burnt out. They've got compassion fatigue setting in, and it makes it very difficult to keep them motivated. But what does motivate them is the fact that they have colleagues that are still working. They know that if they don't show up to work, that that colleague is going to be stuck working a longer shift. Or, you know, you got colleagues who have children many people find the motivation in knowing that this is my partner, this is my teammate, this is my fellow nurse. And so I need to go in and be there and be supportive and do my part to make sure that everyone else isn't burnt out. So it's almost like that internal motivation just because you know you have other people who you work with day in and day out that you simply don't want to end up being burnt out or being left alone on a shift. You know, um, oftentimes what you have to do is actually just have conversation with the team, like acknowledge that it's scary and let them know that they aren't alone. And like, you can't be that manager who doesn't show up either. Right. Like you're home safe while you're telling everyone else to go out there and fight the good fight right? You've got to be there on the front line with them, really being supportive and showing them that you're doing their best to advocate for their safety, to make sure they have the PPE they need, to make sure they know that, you know, you aren't going to just turn your back on them and they're going to be left to fend for themselves. So part of that is knowing I have a manager who's got my back and then I've got colleagues that if I leave unsupported, like they're going to have a really hard day at work today. Can't hear you. Can you guys hear me? Sorry. All right. So I know personally when this is all said and done, when the coronavirus runs its course, there's going to have to be a lot of rebuilding. And this is basically just for anybody who went through it, not, not just technically first responders, but just society itself. But I think, again, speaking from corrections perspective, I think that we're going to have a lot to recover from, including trying to build that different type of trust with people. It was crazy because when this first started happening, a lot of us were concerned because we didn't think that people were going to respect that social distancing because people are so used to, you know, being connected. You know, I found out quickly that I was a face talker. I get in the people's face and you know, I, I found that out that quick in coronavirus. Like, hey, Gange, six fucking feet, Gange, six feet. Um, but then, you know, what's funny, moods start to change. As months go by, we become conditioned to where, I, I kind of give this, this example where when it first started, people would, you know, give out the handshake. Like, oh, sorry, I can't shake your hand. Now it's more like, eh, people just, they're, they're becoming hesitant. And my concern is in the aftermath, you're going to have people that, have become very distant and very isolated. And then I think that tears apart the fabric of why we do what we do. We, we in, in first responders, but again, speaking for corrections, 
we're motivated by the need to protect our brothers and sisters, yes, but also protect society, but in the prison system, really, to protect our brothers and sisters. If we feel there's an um, altercation between an inmate and an officer, we, we, get, you know, we jump in, inmate and staff member, we jump in because that's our family. We have to do whatever we can to preserve that connection. And I have a feeling that when this is said and done, we're going to lose a piece of that. That's why I think as this goes on, as we go through this, this pandemic, we should have meetings, uh, you know, a few times a month with, you know, mental health specialists or people just to kind of help us through it and try to keep us balanced between a world that wants us six feet away and a world that demands that we're a lot closer than that. Because the last thing I did in the academy was they brought us all together as close as we can get. And they said, this is how it feels behind that wall. And all you have is each other. You know, I don't want to lose that feeling because that feeling has motivated me throughout my career to be true to what I do and don't mess with the integrity or mess with what can hurt my brothers or sisters. And I feel we're, we're losing a bit of that. But I, I'm sure like, uh, Connie, you worked frontline in medical. So you know, there's a bond there. There's a closeness there. And you have to do what we have to do every day to motivate people that even though we have to be distant in today's world, we have to find a way to also stay connected. How, how hard is that knowing that your front line, that medical front line is really, they're exposed, you know? So how do yeah, you- Yeah, I mean, so, you know, our reality is that we stay connected because we are having this shared experience together. We are on this front line together and going through things together and witnessing all of these events together and i think that's something that we'll never be able to get away from if anything i think for many people who do survive this it will be that we went through that together remember that day when you know because those are the times where you can reflect back on so this is what we did when we remember when we ran out of gloves what we did you know it's that kind of stuff that really makes people stay close because you only have each other to lean on Right. But I, I agree, by the way, 100 percent, Connie. I just hope that we have more departments that are willing to not wait for the aftermath to start cleaning up the pieces, but rather help us through the process of it happening. Like I have a feeling right now there's such an urgency with making sure that the areas are covered and we got the manpower and we're doing what we got to do. But we're not really helping people get through the process of, OK, this is what's happening. And, you know, this is how you have to deal with it at this moment, you know, because. I, I, again, and maybe Greg can comment on this a little bit too, is, is I think this is more about not waiting until we get to the end where the damage is already done, but rather be preventive and try to do what you can throughout the process to make sure if there is damage, it, it doesn't leave behind these scars that cannot heal themselves. Would you, would you agree with that, Greg? Yeah, I think... <sighs> And from a personal experience, uh, I don't want to get into the, the, the gory details of, of all the different experiences that would have led to my PTSD. Um, but in one particular instance, we had a tragic accident. Uh, there was a death in custody. There were several officers. And that evening, we, of course, uh, they gathered all the officers that were involved in the, the, the tr critical incident and they gathered us up and they sat us down. We sat with a, a grief counselor and a chaplain and we had a nice long conversation about all the things. That's not what happened. It's not what happened at all. And Tony, you can probably relate to this. What happened was there was a death in custody. We all went back. We took our gear off. And where did we go? We went to somebody's house and we did probably uh, – half a bottle of uh, Jack and probably three dozen beers. We didn't handle it appropriately, but that's how we dealt with it. We didn't have the grief counseling. Nobody gave us the tools. Every time we had a critical incident, every time there was uh, of a riot, every time was a, a stabbing, uh, there was a, an incident where there was severe violence when I, when I had to pull a broomstick out of a guy's uh, rib cage. We didn't sit with grief counselors. We sat with our friends, Jack and Johnny, and, and we drank and, and we did things that probably weren't appropriate and weren't healthy, but the tools weren't there for us. But we have to deal with it immediately. There needs to be immediate incident command 
uh, stress management, and, and we need to find ways for these people to talk it through. Corrections and law enforcement, it's all about how tough we are, how strong we are, how leathery is our skin, and how well we can handle it. Put your humility aside, put your, excuse me, put your pride aside and take the help that's out there. Reach out to those sources because it will eat you from the inside out and you won't know it till it's way too late. I, I want to elaborate on that because you're absolutely correct that there are resources out there to help, you know, and I think a lot of departments don't know how to tap into those resources, especially when they have a very limited budget. When you look at resources like the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation, which I talked about in my PTSD uh, video that we did the other day, and I touched base on, on earlier today, um, when you looked at those programs, they're not that expensive to send a few people to those programs or even to bring an instructor into your facility to start working on a crisis management team, a critical incident stress management team, a debriefing and a defusing team. Um, you know, you can bring an instructor and you can teach anywhere from 10 to 50 people in one day, in two days how to properly deal with, you know, high stress, high trauma situations. Um, the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation has a website. You can go to it. You can find out who the instructors are in the state or area you live in and bring somebody in to train that team to help, uh, you know, mitigate that stress, to help with coping mechanisms and to learn how to properly take care of yourself after you go through major cr uh, trauma and crisis so that you help prevent PTSD. You may, you may not. Some people may still get it but at least there's resources and an outreach program to help get them what they need. You know, that's the difference. PTSD does not mean the end of your career. It doesn't mean the end of your happiness or your joy in your life. You just need to know how the coping mechanisms that you need to be able to continue on as a, in your profession and personally, and having a team in the outreach that can bring you the resources you need to do that is a difference between having people who crumble under the pressure of PTSD or possibly even become suicidal and those who continue on and be successful in their life despite having a permanent brain injury from PTSD. It is an injury. It's, it's a body chemistry change. And when you're talking about dopamine levels and adrenaline levels and drinking and smoking and doing all the things we think it's a good way to get rid of stress, we're actually compacting and increasing our chances of PTSD. And, you know, nobody talks about that when I was in the academy. I don't think most academies are talking about it now. It's a conversation that needs to start. Administration and training facilities need to start that conversation in the beginning so people are prepared and they have longevity in their career. Oh, so am I understanding that this is not a standard procedure? This is like nothing's been set in place to take those steps? I mean, to me, it sounds there, like it there are There are some states, some uh, agencies, some counties, some places that do have crisis management teams in place, debriefing and diffusing teams in, in place. Um, and, and, you know, the language is changing. There, there's more and more education about PTSD and people are beginning to take it seriously. But there's still an element of our profession of first responders that don't think, you know, they think that you're tough and you don't get PTSD and you just got to suck it up buttercup and move on and we don't need that. And, you know, it's not something that would qualify you for workman's comp and it's not an injury. It's not a permanent issue. And the reality is that no matter how tough you are, how much of a warrior mentality you have, no matter how strong you are and how educated you are and how good you are at your job, at the end of the day, you're just a human being with human emotions. And when you get home, cumulative stress over time or even a single major event can be enough to start tripping your body chemistry to have what they call PTS, which is post-traumatic stress. Post-traumatic stress, when it's continued and it's exacerbated by chronic adrenaline dumps, eventually can become post-traumatic stress disorder. It can happen from one event such as yours where your husband died and you went through a very traumatic thing, or it can happen from a culmination of many events. Um, and they have what's called the DSM, the Diagnost Diagnostic Statistical Manual, which is what um, mental health care professionals use to diagnose people. And that in itself has been evolving over the last five, you know, five to seven years in what the definition of PTSD is. And so now we're just starting to be aware and accept the fact that there's cumulative stress that can bring on PTSD. And that conversation 
that education needs to happen across the board in every agency, in every state, in every county, in every federal level of law enforcement, corrections, firefighters, EMS, doctors, nurses. I mean, doctors and nurses see a ton of stuff on a daily basis that's dramatic, traumatic, horrifying. Um, and, and they have a huge amount of pressure to perform and save lives and do the best they can. They also endure a lot of trauma. So, you know, and corrections officers, you have it even different than law enforcement does. Law enforcement can take a break and go to their local convenience store and bullshit with the community and have a coffee and take a break from what they're immersed in in their eight, 10 or 12 hour, 16 hour shift. Corrections doesn't have that opportunity. You don't get to go down to the convenience store and get away and have a coffee and decompress from your day. You are immersed in your shift of four, eight, 10, 16, 24 hours, whatever it is of dealing with chronic stress, chronic tension, you know, being always on high alert, being aware of what's around you, your life, your safety, everybody else's life and safety in the facility. So you have a lot more pressure that could potentially add up to having post-traumatic stress disorder than those of us who are out on the street doing stuff. I, I'm, and there's plenty of police officers that are exposed to enough bad crap. I don't want to discredit that. I'm just saying that corrections really, really is knee deep and immersed in the things that can start to cause those issues. So I guess my question is, um, because of that, that high impact type of situation you guys are in, immersed in constantly, how is that not part of the... Like, so an incident happens, how does that, like what Greg was saying, you know, they, they responded to an incident, but rather than get debriefed, they went to go kill a bottle of Jack. Um, you know, how, how is that missing component not part of the process? And then when, when is it overkill? Well, the, if, you, if, you, if you look at the, at the mentality of how things evolve in public policing, uh, how about the military? Um, corrections, law enforcement, you know, firefighters, all those different things across the board, the lingo, the lingo and language is starting to change about PTSD and chronic stress. You know, when you have military personnel, personnel, you have 22 people committing suicide a day in the United States. That tells you that the educational process and the language has not changed enough to accommodate the mental health issues that arise from being in combat situations to make a safe space for those people to manage that stress so that they don't become suicidal. When you're losing more law enforcement officers to suicide and corrections officers to suicide than you are from them getting killed on the job, the language hasn't transpired enough. So although it's changing, you know, for you to ask, you know, how can that not be part of the program? That's a really good question. And that's something that I've pushed a lot on the Leo Roundtable. I remember when I first started on the show, discussions about PTSD, I was kind of, you know, people kind of poo-pooed it. Now you have people asking questions. Now you have more people getting trained by the ICISF. You do see the changes, but it needs to continue and it needs to reach administrative levels. Um, and, and the ranks, the people that are out there doing the work need to know that administration supports them and cares enough about them to provide them with the tools they need to deal with that chronic stress. I'm presuming that some of this stuff with that, like with other departments, when, when, um, Processes are not implemented into the departments. It's usually because there's dollar signs that's attached to it that they cannot afford. The, is there like a place where these departments who are lacking those types of funds in order to support that type of program, is there a place where they can look for grants that can support this type of program? I'm sure that there are grants. I know the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation has scholarships that people can apply for in order to take training. And honestly, the training is not that much money. Uh, you know, if you're somebody who loves your job and you love your brothers and sisters on your job, whatever that is, whether it's, you know, uh, you're a doctor, a nurse, a firefighter, a police officer, a corrections officer, whatever it is that you're doing, go send yourself to an ICIS school. They're offered all over the United States on a regular basis. The cost is not prohibitive. Uh, you know, you might be looking at $100 for a two-day class where you're going to get a wealth of information to help yourself and to help others. And if you really, you know, like what you learn and you become curious about it, you can become an instructor. You know, the process to become an instructor takes a bit of time, takes a little bit of an investment, but then you could turn around and teach in your own facility and certify people to be, you know, under the ICISF guidelines so that they can help help one another and, and they can formulate a team. A lot of teams are volunteer. And, and there's even um, 
free services, you know, let's say you work in a facility and you have in, in a jail or a prison and you have a major incident happen, you can call the ICISF and they will send a team out to help you for free. You don't need, there is no cost for that. They like, you know, the, the program might like a donation or something, but there's plenty of resources. If somebody called me up and was going up through something and they wanted me to respond, I would get a group together and come or even come on my own to try to help who I can uh, to help at least set up, you know, get them going in the right direction. Obviously I can't do it all on my own. It's a, t it's a team effort, but I could at least help guide them what to do next. Cody, I, 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 I am absolutely in agreement with you that money is not the issue. I don't think money is the issue at all because departments are willing to put the issue in. I truly believe the issue is staff is not aware and staff doesn't want to show a con what they would consider a weakness. That's the biggest issue. Corrections is all about our toughness. And we... Mm -hmm. It's not that we shouldn't do this. We absolutely should. I remember going through uh, critical incident training and going through all these classes and felt like, wow, this is really good information. But the brothers and sisters I had behind the wall were like, yeah, those are good classes, but I don't need it. Because there's a, there's a level of expectation that we're not, we don't need that help. We do. We absolutely do. We but absolutely I think it's not financial. I think it's more an attitude. I think it is an attitude too. And I think that's where the language has to change because let me tell you something as somebody who's a survivor of PTSD and has some pretty severe PTSD, I've learned coping skills, but there was a point in my life where my life was, you know, completely falling apart. I was crumbling. My personal relationships suffered. My professional relationships suffered. My ability to do my job was suffering not because I'm incapable, but because I was so overwhelmed, I couldn't seem to f climb out of that pocket of crap I was immersed in. I had critical incident after critical incident after critical incident happening. I had a lifelong of trauma that stacked up against me and eventually I cracked. Let me tell you, if you think that you're tough, you will find out exactly how weak you can be when PTSD gets so bad for you that your life falls apart and you gotta climb back up from the bottom, from the pits of hell, to become a whole person again. So if you really are tough, be tough enough to get yourself some help. Be tough enough not to become suicidal. Be tough enough to educate yourself and do the right thing to protect yourself so you have longevity on your, on your job, so you have the skills you need to stay on that job and endure and, and deal with all the crap you have to deal with. And uh, that's when you're tough. You're tough when you can admit that you need help and you can rise above what you perceive as a weakness. I want to add on something on that because I want to talk. I have actually two questions, one for Connie and then one for Renice. Um, I see the clapping. <laughs> I guess maybe you can hear me. Uh, I, I want to go with Connie first. I mean, are, are you guys expected to have that same tough persona in medical? So, yeah, we are. You know, the expectation, especially when you think of um, undue familiarity and what that could look like if you aren't tough. Right. If you are too caring or too compassionate or too empathetic, that can look badly from the outside. And so medical incorrections can be very standoffish, not as um, as you would see a medical professional out in the community. There is a certain social distance that's kept in general just because of the climate. And so with that expectation, sometimes it's very difficult for medical to come forward and actually talk about those tough situations that they faced. You know, we had, I remember we had an offender who was known to everyone. This offender had been in the facility for a long period of time. She was a frequent flyer and she had a relationship internal to the facility with another offender that went south. And so she decided she was going to take her life. And the days prior, she had done all these little things, you know, the favorite provider. She had made like some really weird statement and the provider didn't really make nothing of it prior to, you know, she had started giving her things away, giving away her commissary. It was like all these little things that you kind of could know in hindsight that something was coming. Um, and then here it is, she makes the attempt, and most people assumed that, you know, she, 
it wasn't intentional. She didn't think if she was going to succeed, but in the timing of things, everything kind of worked in her favor where it was successful. And you had everyone who responded, who they were doing CPR. They were like everything that should have been done within that code was being done. But this was someone that even though it was offender, an offender, people actually liked this person. Like she was a likable person just in general. And so you've got nursing doing CPR and her chest is already rigid and you know it's no longer working, but they continue because you have to continue until EMS arrives. And you've got custody who's jumping in to continue compressions as well, because now the entire team is exhausted, but everyone's helping because this is what we're supposed to do. And so when this happens, you've got a nurse who's going into the, the actual ambulance bus, still doing compressions and she's exhausted but she can't even take a moment to be like, oh my God, I know this person is dead. I can no longer compress because she's now rigid. And when you come out of that, where do you go to have that conversation? Oh my goodness, this was like this offender that everyone got along with, that people, like, she was a likable person. She stayed in her lane, you know? oh my goodness, we knew the girlfriend. And so here are all these things that begin to unfold, but here's all this emotion that comes with it, that we're not supposed to feel sad because an offender has died. We're not supposed to feel sad that this person was in treatment and somewhere along the way, there was a breakdown in treatment possibly. Perhaps there was something with medication that could have been done differently. I mean, hindsight is twenty twenty, and you want to go through the health record and figure out all the things that we could have done differently. But it doesn't take away the fact that all this administrative stuff has to happen, the investigation, the interviews, the this, the that, and folks still haven't processed that they were just in a situation where they were doing CPR on a dead body. And how, how do you process that? So because people knew, like, so administration did acknowledge that this was someone everyone knew. And so they did have like a critical incident team come in and kind of talk about it, but no one was talking. You've got the team kind of like pulling it out. It like, so, you know, you could tell the team was struggling to kind of get the buy-in of the group that it was a safe space to talk. And so when you don't feel like it's a safe space, then everyone is tough. Everyone is posturing. Everyone is waiting to get out of there. Whatever the time is, we got to sit with this person. We're going to sit with them and then we're going to get out of here. And then we're going to figure out who we can talk to and do it on our own, which isn't really helpful. Connie, you know, what's great. You reminded me of a story where, uh, beginning of my career, I responded to a suicide, you know, and, you know, did what we could. Um, sad thing is, you know, the person was successful. Prison's very unique in how they commit suicide. They don't hang themselves off structures, but rather lean on, lean off of something. And um, I remember going through the whole incident and, and, you know, there are some people kind of trying to brush it off, you know, hey, it's an inmate. It's, a, it's like, yeah, but you know what? One thing is you're right. You deal with this life every day that can have an impact because it's an interaction. It's a routine that you're used to that automatically just changes. The other thing is, is there's the fact that if you take this job seriously, this is your job and this is what you're out to do. And you know, this is your role. You may take it as I failed. This was what I was supposed to do today. And I failed. Then there's the other avenue where not only did I fail, did I mess up? Am I still going to have a job? You know, so so there's many different layers to why something like that can have an effect on someone. And, and management knows, like, or management should know how to address that individual. The first thing is, for me, a life's a life. So, you know, that's one thing. You know, I, 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 haven't, I haven't minimized the importance of someone killing themselves because I see it all the time. I, I, I try my best not to get used to that, you know. And even though I've seen a lot of it, I still try my best to treat each situation as unique as it is because the life deserves that. I remember my nephew killed himself and I had no emotion to it. And that's when I knew something was wrong with me because I was turning cold to what I was dealing with every day. And I had to know that there was a time and place for that. And that's when I knew something was wrong with me because I'm turning off an emotion that really I shouldn't be, I, I need to process that eventually. So I don't know why I'm turning that off, but 
that's a great dialogue that you just said because you don't even know. I mean, the suicide could trigger maybe that person had a suicide in the past that, that was close and whatever it is. I mean, you never know what triggers that person. So for people to think that we're, you know, we automatically can come in and remove the humanity and be in this profession, they're wrong. You know, we have the courage to do what we can to battle through, but that doesn't mean that we're not vulnerable. It means we're willing to look into the face of terror, but doesn't mean that we're not going to be scarred from it either. You know, it's just, we step up. And I have a question for um, Renice too, uh, with the family. So, and I think Greg, I don't know if Greg or, uh, or Cody, uh, and, and yeah, even um, especially in today's day and age with the coronavirus, um, Connie could definitely maybe want to feed in on this as well. But, you know, let's say someone gets hurt at work. So I'm talking from the corrections perspective. Uh, however we define the person getting hurt would really relate to the job or medical, maybe that fear of that coronavirus that's putting the medical front line at risk. And let's just say that, you know, the person gets hurt, they go through a near-death experience, and, you know, the family, of course, is frustrated because, again, you promised your life to me, and you almost lost it because you got assaulted by an inmate, blah, 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 and then time comes for now this person to go back to work. You know, so now they have to go ahead and, and convince their family that it's okay, but also the family has to know that in our line of work, we need 100% attention. We can't be able to work effectively thinking that you don't support what we do either. That, that kind of gets very distracting where I'm going to work now, but it gets my family's wishes. And all I can think about now is my family and I'm not focusing on the job. So is there a level, and this is, I think, a question that um, I think has to come up because we talked about how hard you have to be or how hard you think you got to be to be in this profession, both law enforcement side, medical side, but also the family side. So is there a level where you think people expect you to be able to deal with it because they know that you've had this conversation, you allow, or they think you allow your husband to do this type of work. So if something tragic happens, they kind of say, well, you knew that, you know, you should have expected that and kind of move on with your day. Yes. So we always get the, you knew what you were marrying into, right? Um, and that kind of gets old because it's like, yes, I knew what I was getting, what I was marrying into. What I didn't realize was that while I was married into it, it came without a proper support system that should have rounded back, come back around to me to help me properly. Um, I, I truly believe that, that in all the professions that there's, the dialogue is difficult, especially with high risk occupations. And, um, you know, and every relationship is different. I've heard some relationships where it was volatile. When I was young, I was in one of those types of relationships with my husband. <laughs> it just, it was passionate. But, um, you know, there's just this lack of understanding um, that because of the lack of conversation that's being had. Um, Again, we're filling in the blanks about the dangers of the job, but we don't quite understand the whole concept of what it is because when the guys come home from work, they don't want to talk about it, you know? Um, so we're left to sort of kind of just support something unknowingly and be okay with that. And sometimes, you know, like every single day for so many years, sometimes it gets to like not be okay anymore because now you're coming home smelling like alcohol um, or you're staying out all night, you know, so there's some dynamics and changes to the relationships that happen. Um, and I'm sorry, I didn't marry into that part. That part was, was not told to me at the beginning of this contract of marriage. Um, so I would say that um, it does have to, the dialogue does have to come along when, when everybody's doing that annual training um, somewhere along the line, there's got, maybe there, there needs to be a more stronger support system. Like our department back home here, they they have a wife's, uh, a spouse's support system where the spouses of the law enforcement officers um, are pretty strong core support program for each other. Um, and if someone gets injured, these, these wives, you know, come together and help support that spouse, be it bring toilet paper, a bag of rice, and, you know, maybe cook your, cook the family a meal, because that's something that's going to be missing in the day of, you know, distress. Um, but the expectation of what we're expected to have to just put up with, and then be told, well, you know, 
you you've been dealt the cards you knew which cards you you were going to get dealt and you know this was inevitable and then to follow up with that it's kind of been a year now and you're still crying about this you know when are you going to get over it you know um the spouse the, the widows and i have come up with like these jokes that we're going to come up with this book of 2000 things not to say, you know, <laughs> build a bridge and get over it. You know, well, you're young, you can marry again. You know, I was told that I was only 28 at the time. So, you know, you you have, you're really cute. There's a lot of people that will, will want to marry you and, you know, you can move on and why aren't you moving on? And, you know, there's something probably wrong with you because you're un- incapable of moving on. I mean, they, it's attack from all sides and all angles at, in every degree at your, 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 um, I don't know what you call it, your, your confidence at your body, at your, your culture, at your, your intelligence or your, your not so intelligence, just it's, um, we don't have a really good solid foundation following a death notification to, to stand on because there's all of these expectations that are thrown at us that we have to carry that as well as try to mitigate through the rest of the issues that is, that's coming forward following the death. You know, I would like to also forward that same question to Connie first, then Greg, and then Cody. Uh, Connie, I guess, obviously, medical coronavirus. I'm sure there's some medical personnel that has to go to work and the family's being resistant. How would you approach that if you were the employee that's forced to go to work and has to make that choice of going to work or, you know, dealing with the family? So a lot of what we do um, on the civilian side, especially with medical, is really have a lot of conversations about work-life balance. Like, it really matters that as a part of that work-life balance that you actually have a strong support system outside of work. And that includes your family and your friends. So having those conversations with your family up front so they understand what your life is behind the wall and what level of commitment is required of you. Even though your family may not live it, many of them do understand what the actual experience is and why you're as committed as you are. So what we do is really support those staff that, you know, certainly are making that decision. I mean, because you call out, you call out, right? Like we can't come and pull you out of your home. And if you're just willing to deal with the consequences, like there's really not much else that we could do. You know, it, it is just sheer will of folks who are willing to come in and still just do their jobs. The most that we can do is try to make sure that they know they're supported. You know, I, I think the support is the biggest thing that keeps them coming, that then they know that they are supported and they're not in it on their own. I think that is key because, as I said, and I think Greg may feed off on this, uh, is that your family, I don't, I understand why they're going through it. You made a promise to them and God forbid, you, know, you just almost got hurt. Now reality kicks in for the family. You know, reality kicks in that this is a job where I can lose somebody, you know, and I don't know if I'm willing to have you go back, but you also have to realize if the person's put in a position where they have to go back, you being resistant to them going back may add to the concern of them being able to be effective at their job. And family's going to have to look back and say, you know, God forbid I'm doing something to distract them in a world where they have to have a hundred percent focus on where they need to be. But Greg, I mean, you've been involved in a lot of situations. I'm sure you've had to break it down to your family. I mean, you have to be truthful with them. You don't want to sugarcoat it to them because I, I remember Lieutenant Floyd out of, uh, Delaware, when, when he was killed in a riot, he told his family everything because in the end, it was his family that continued the fight. It was the wife that continued to fight. So if the wife didn't know and he sugarcoated things to her, she wouldn't know where to go. But she knew everything because that's the relationship they had. But she also knew the reality of what her husband did. And again, he did it because, hey, if something ever happens to me, you're the only one in the long run that's going to continue the fight because eventually everything fizzles out. The people that next to you that are saying, Hey, call me anytime you need me. Eventually they look at you like you're, you're annoying. It it all fizzles out. It all fizzles out. But the wife remains, the wife is there every day or the husband, the spouse, the family there every day to continue the battle. But 
Greg, you know, you've done these situations, then you're, you know, you ever get kickbacks from your family? And if you did, how do you tell your family, I got to do this? And how do you get them to accept it? Well, I think it's, it's, a, it's a huge issue in corrections because as I do meet with hundreds and hundreds of correctional professionals across the country, we talk about at the end of the day, when you go home to your family and your family asks, how was your day? Most of them respond with one word. It's fine. And that's the end of the conversation. And that is unhealthy. It is difficult, very difficult to explain to people outside of corrections, outside of law enforcement, first responders, to explain to them exactly what I saw today. I joke in my classes about I, I, how do you explain to someone outside of our world what a poop casso is? I mean, that's a nonviolent situation, but that's a guy who has painted the inside of his cell with his own feces, and we have to deal with that in corrections. You know, I'm sure Connie's had to deal with those mental health cases as well, and they're not any fun, but it's part of the life. But when those violent situations come up and you haven't explained it to your family, and that does happen, they won't have a clue. So yes, sharing with your family, sharing with a close friend, and maybe it is not necessarily a chaplain, but someone of faith that you can share with so you can express yourself. That's critical. The other piece I want to bring up real quick is this. When we have somebody on our team who has to take an extra day or two to recover, to sit back, to, to a men take a mental health day, we're so ingrained on we're a team and if you don't show up, somebody else has to work that shift for you and now I got to work a 16. Hey, maybe them taking that one day, that mental health break is going to get them strong enough so that they can make it through the next six, eight, 12 months, year, whatever. We need to stop giving each other crap when we take a mental health day. Yes, we need to take our days off, stop working 12, 16 hour days in a row. The money's great, but we need a mental health break and stop giving each other grief about taking a day or two off because it is critical for our, I think Cody called it PTS, that it not become PTSD. Wow. And uh, again, Cody, I'm going to go to you as well. I mean, we heard your story, which was a uh, phenomenal. Guys, if you get a chance, you got to check out the video I did right before this with Cody, where we break down what she went through, what she learned through the process, including seeking help, having the courage to do that. You know, have, I have a problem, have an insight to know what that problem is and knowing where to go so you can come out better, but also not leaving it there, taking what, what she learned and sharing it to others because obviously she knew where her resistance was. And I think having that connection with those who need it really helps break that wall down. But Cody, same thing, Cody. You know, you've been on the job. You've had some concerns and having to tell your loved one, I got to go back. And they're telling you no. You know, how, how do you deal with that? Well, I think it's imperative that the relationships you establish in your life outside of your, you know, who you can't pick, you can't pick your parents and you can't pick your siblings because they've already actually happened. But, you know, the, the people you immerse in your life, whether it's your friends or your spouses, um, they need to understand full heartedly where you're coming from with your career. You know, most of us in this type of job don't do it just for money. Uh, we do it because we're impassioned about it. We love it. It's part of our personality. We want to serve that, you know, it's just like the military, same thing. They want to serve. There's a certain amount of pride and, and a certain amount of, uh, of yourself that you give up for it. And people need to understand that and, and respect that. And the, and those around us, of course, can be concerned and worried about us, but the reality is what there's a potential for something to happen to us and they need, they're going to have to accept that. That's, that's reality. Now, one of the things I, I want to touch on just a few things in closing. One is that I want people to consider who are in corrections and law enforcement and other first responders. We aren't just talking about if you die in the line of duty. How about if you get cancer? How about if you get a spinal cord or a neck injury like I did? How about if you break your leg? Where, what are your expectations? How are you going to plan financially for that? What if you had to leave the job and retire due to your injuries like I did? What's your next course of action in your life? If you can only identify with your job and the people you work with and you have no family and friends established outside of, of just the job, life's going to become very difficult when you get a reality check that you can't do this anymore. You know, you have to allow yourself to have hobbies and interests and things that you love that are outside of your job. And just like Greg said, you know, working 14, 15, 16 days straight, work, you know, cramming in a bunch of overtime after a while, your body and your brain is going to be so tuned into what you're doing. You're not going to allow room for other things and you need those other things to be healthy. 
So let's talk real briefly. I'm going to show you some resources about what families can do to support their loved ones who are working in corrections or law enforcement or any other first responders. This is a book called Loving Somebody with PTSD. It's a great resource for family members to learn about helping the people they love cope with PTSD. So I highly recommend this, this woman who wrote this book. Don't make me say her last name because I cannot pronounce it properly and I'll look like a complete idiot. So just read it on the screen. We will, it's also in my other video. Um, she does a second book. For those of us who have PTSD, this is valuable because often PTSD surrounds itself with mistrust. You know, you start to have a lack of trust in the world around you, even your loved ones, your friends, your family, your reactions start to change due to your adrenalized um, harboring of your feelings and what's going on. Um, this is a great book, Trust After Trauma. Um, it's a great guide to relationships for survivors and those who love them. Um, it has a lot of workbooks and little things in it that can help you through your path. I highly recommend it. And another book that I recommend that's uh, by Ron Potter Efron, E-F-R-O-N. He's a master's in social work and it's called Angry All the Time. Often people with PTSD will have anger uh, issues. You'll find that you, you know, you snap, your kids are asking you a question, you're overwhelmed by it, or your spouse asks you a question or does something and you find that you have a knee jerk reaction to respond to anger. This is a really good resource to learn about why you have that as your knee jerk reaction to the life around you. Uh, nobody should live being angry all the time or having a lack of trust and family members should be able to understand what you're enduring. So those are definitely three resources that I like. Wow. And I'll tell you something. Uh, again, uh, when we had Cody on, she mentioned a little bit more of a breakdown on those resources, but also, and I'm going to try to see if I can get them on in a few days, some people that may be in a position to run a facility, uh, including the Onsite Academy. I'm working on that now so we could break down the services that they provide and just, you know, give you a better understanding. And I think that will close off just a really good roundabout discussion that encompasses five videos with over 10 hours at this point of um, just good, good quality content. Um, so just in closing, um, Renice, I'd like you to go first. And I was wondering if, if it's okay, if you can give your contact information out again, because there's a lot of stuff that you sent me in the email, but I figure if people are watching it, I think it would be good if they could get it directly from you as well, because you'll be able to answer the questions that they may have. Sure. So my email is no AL associates. Um, it's N O E A U A S S O C at gmail.com. Um, yeah. So you can reach me with that, but um, yeah, I, I just wanted to sort of kind of just um, tag on to what you folks were saying is, you know, when the spouses are fussing um, it's because of it, because it's fear, you know, we're, we're we're just, we're just scared. We're scared. The, the bajibis are scared out, you know, been scared out of us that you have to go back to work. And if the, and the fear is coming from just lack of information and lack of knowing. So it, we can be spared the gory details, but like the facts, the facts are helpful to give to the spouses rather than leave them in the dark and just be told, you know, just leave me alone, you crazy lady, you know, you're impeding on my, my job or whatever. But also to emphasize what Cody said is to make sure that they understand, I need you to hear this because if I'm worried about you worrying about me, it's going to impact my job and my ability to perform safely and come home back, come back home to you, which is the whole issue what we're fighting about. So having a, um, a meaningful conversation with the with the with the spouses and understanding that all of our fussing is just coming from straight fear of not knowing. Yeah, you know what's funny is uh, that's where it would be great if we're able to do something where the families could get an understanding of of the profession, kind of balance it out, and maybe lift alleviate a little some of the fear of the unknown. But you still have the fact that you know different things happen all the time. But the point is, is I think a little bit more knowledge about what we do you know, can help out because that will give you a better understanding of maybe discussions you're having with your spouse. Right. Hey, well, uh, let me put it this way. If you don't inform your family member, they're going to get it from some uninformed source and they're going to be putting pieces together by themselves to make it, make it make sense to them. And it's just going to be a hodgepodge of misinformation that's going to send them down, you know, to Crazyville. 
So it's it's better to just come straight from you than than from some other source that they're going to be maybe misinformed or having the wrong information given to them. Yeah, I think we labeled that the wheel of fortune syndrome. Yeah. Yeah, I re- I remember. Hey, uh, Cody, do you mind saying something in closing to our audience? Yeah, I think I, you know, what I really want to say in closing is that no matter what you're enduring on this job or whether you're the loved one of somebody on this job, none of us are alone and we need to support one another and reach out to one another and realize that, you know, whatever's going on today, tomorrow will be in the past and to, to you know, you got to endure those struggles and hang on um, and don't give up. You know, when things are tough and you need help, reach out, ask for help. There's resources. Um, there's those who have endured what you've endured to an extent. Uh, you know, obviously each person's journey is a little bit unique, but, um, you know, I hope that what we've talked about brings something to the table to families and members on the job um, and helps them plan for their future and plan for what they need to endure and understand that they're not alone when it comes to stress and trauma um, and even PTSD. Right. And, and, you know, I know that this video was kind of long, but let me just mention something just to kind of, this is great information. It's quality. And the thing is, is when people are sharing these stories, you don't cut them off. You let them share their stories and then you take what you can. If you have to watch this in pieces, you watch it in pieces. But the great thing about the stuff we do is that sometimes, or most of the time at this point, a lot of the stuff that we do on Tear Talk finds its way into training academies or in colleges. Uh, Connie could vouch for that. I also speak every year at Rutgers, Seton Hall, uh, and sometimes I get the opportunity to speak at Monroe because uh, Connie works there. So you know, if anything, it's informative. Take your time, process it. You know, if you have a chance, you can go ahead and just, you know, if, if you see the videos long, you know, do it in pieces. YouTube remembers where you left off. But again, if, if, even though you may see it as a, it's a long video, it's long because the journey's long. It's not meant to be a 10 minute discussion. Not when you're sharing stories like this. Uh, Cody, you had one more thing you wanted to say? Yeah, I absolutely. I just wanted to say that, you know, we've posted a few videos this week, uh, Anthony has, and that I already got a private thank you letter. I, I can be reached, uh, you know, through Facebook Messenger or on LinkedIn. Um, and I did receive a message from a viewer who watched and, you know, wanted to thank us for, for putting our stories out there. Um, and I, I think that it's interesting to see that we're already touching and affecting people in a positive way. And I really hope this video does that for someone else as well. Only takes one. It really does. It only takes one. Hey, Greg, you have anything you want to say in closing to our audience? I want to just make sure that we're very clear that I have nothing but respect for every person that wears a uniform. And I, and I, that, that goes from uh, military, uh, obviously uh, EMT, fire corrections, law enforcement. We're a, we're a, a ragtag group of people that do an amazing job all across this country, but it's really important that we do sometimes realize that we're not the toughest people. We're not all Billy badass. We do need help. We do need each other. There's a reason we call it a, a, a brotherhood. No offense to, to Cody, I mean, we, we call it that brotherhood because we do need each other. And I think it's stronger if you take a moment to turn to that person next to you and truly say, everything okay? You need a minute? Let's talk a little. Take those opportunities. And that goes deeper than just making sure your brother and sister is good on the line. Ask about their family. Ask about those spouses because those folks are feeling just as much stress as we are. And if we're not communicating with our, our spouses, the ones that we have now, we're going to move along from them. And we're going to find another one, another one, another. It's just going to be a horrible cycle. So hang on to the ones you love. Take care of each other. And know we are stronger when we share than if we try and keep it inside. That's very powerful, Greg. Hey, Connie, you have anything you'd like to say in closing? I would just like to say to anyone, everyone watching, is that the experiences you have might be unique to you, but there are other people who have shared experiences. And, you know, the, the power is in that story and sharing that story because you just never know how that's going to help the next person. You never know how it's going to encourage and motivate somebody else to 
just get up and try again, you know, get up and move on. <laughs> Thank you, Cody. <laughs> you know, that is just our reality. Yes, it is tough, but you don't have to go at it alone. And there are resources out there. I mean, if you don't know what your organization offers, EAP seems to be like a universal language, right? Um, everyone can get some sort of EAP with their jobs, even if you don't feel comfortable with critical incident. Take it outside. You've got healthcare, right? Take it to a service provider. There are professionals who can help you. You don't have to try to diagnose yourself. And you can go out there and get the help that you need. There are people who can help. And so please just don't do anything drastic. Get some help. You have people here who have been through it who are also getting help as well. And really, if you need anybody, you need anything, you can always reach out to us. Anthony's got the platform to tap into all of these resources for you. Yeah, thank you, Connie, as always. Uh, as always, Connie, it's a pleasure having you guys. Just, just in closing, guys, you know what I, I realized? I want to comment on what we kind of repeated a little bit throughout the, uh, the, the video was that it's not so much that you're going to, if you're going through something, it's not so much that people could step up and give you the exact answer. I think ultimately, you know what that answer is. I think it's about someone saying, I support whatever it is that you have to go through. I mean, my father was dying. I wasn't looking for people to tell me it was okay. I wasn't looking for people to give me answers that he's in a better place. I just want you to sit down and shut up. You know what I mean? As rude as that may sound, but it's true. Hold my hand. Talk me, you know, that you're going to be here and, 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 you know, fulfill that promise when needed. But if you're going to sit there and look for the outcome without understanding that there's a process and that process is you and you determine the outcome, nobody else does, then you're never going to get the help that you want because the help really comes from you. That's the key. I, when I did a video with William Young, one of the things that we discovered uh, along the journey of that video was that when, when we look for an escape, we realize that the escape is a process. It's, it's, it's not the end result. It's like I'm looking to, it's escaping and, you know, ultimately finding what you best need and then being able to apply it for yourself and then having the people around you that can support you. Because in the end, if I was to ask everybody, how did you make it through this? They would be like, oh, all these different people supported me. But if I asked them again, how did you make it through it? Then they start to go in deeper and say, well, I knew I had a problem and I wasn't going to let it get the best of me. So it starts with you and then people being in your corner backing you. As always, guys, the show is here. If you haven't, please subscribe, interact, engage, comment. Oh, wait a second. Now, you know what? I'm going to give Connie a break. Connie, I'm giving you the break. Don't. All right, there you go. Got I'm giving her the break. I'll do the ending myself because it was a very long episode. And at one point, Connie left and got coffee. I saw that. You know, <laughs> I saw that. And, and, and then I also saw Greg... Uh, Took some very long blinks. So, as, <laughs> as always, guys, the show is Tear Talk. Please stay safe. Love you. And uh, one more video, hopefully, on this topic. So, hopefully, we get the best of it.